Welcome back to Media Gito and Southwest Studios as we continue Love and Death, The Murder of Kurt Cobain by Max Wallace and Ian Halperin. Read and commented on by yours truly, Media Gito. It is a special week. It is the week that Kurt Cobain died in 1994, 25 years ago. As such, I will be doing my best this week to give you a video every day. That is my commitment. As we approach April 4th and the week following when Kurt's body lay up in the greenhouse, um, supposedly waiting for someone to discover it. Okay, but we'll get there. Page 177. On November 20th in Niagara Falls, Ontario, an unnamed 17-year-old male hangs himself in his basement bedroom. The day after his funeral, his 19-year-old best friend hangs himself from a tree in the park. The suicides are described in the media as Cobain-related. Both boys were devotees of Nirvana. The mother of one blames death music for the suicides. Two weeks later, a 20-year-old Californian named Lyle Sinek, jokingly emulating Kurt's suicide, accidentally kills himself in front of his friends by propping a 12-gauge shotgun on the floor, then kneeling with his mouth over the barrel. Eventually, there would be 68 documented cases of Cobain copycat suicides worldwide. The real figure is likely in the hundreds, since most suicides don't leave a note. Because it's not an intended suicide, Sinak's death doesn't count in those statistics. Okay. Three-star page break on 178. Enough time for me to say there are 68 official copycat Cobain suicides. The authors here, as I mentioned, posit it in the hundreds. And because, in their words, most suicides don't leave a note. By December 1994, eight months after Kurt's death, Grant is finally ready to go public with his suspicions and chooses a national forum to do so. Appearing on the Gil Gross Show, broadcast over the CBS radio network throughout the United States, he states his belief that Kurt Cobain was murdered. The Seattle police, he says, are not guilty of a cover-up, only a rush to judgment. He refuses to disclose the name of the person he believes committed the crime. I felt I had to go public, Grant recalls. All the copycat suicides were starting to haunt me. All these kids killing themselves because they thought that's what Kurt did. At first, I thought the best strategy would be to avoid naming names. I assumed the media would be less nervous. Nevertheless, within days, he receives a letter from Rosemary Carroll's firm accusing him of airing his baseless allegations for the sake of personal profit and notoriety and warning him to cease and desist with his charges, or the firm would refer the matter to the authorities for possible criminal prosecution. That makes me mad, Grant recalls. Rosemary knows that she was one... Rosemary knows that she was the one who first said Kurt was murdered, and who encouraged me to pursue the investigation. Now here, she was threatening me with legal action if I went public. I thought that was very cowardly of her. His response, dated December 29th, 1994, is blistering. Dear Rosemary, Having received the letter from your firm threatening me with lawsuit and possible criminal prosecution, I have to wonder what must be going on in your head. My loyalty to you and the confidentiality of our conversations ends abruptly when I am threatened for doing a job I was encouraged by you to do. From the beginning, you played a major role in directing this investigation and exposing some facts and details that implicated Courtney as part of the conspiracy that eventually led to Kurt's murder. I'm convinced you know in your heart the truth about what happened. It's time for you to come forward and speak to the authorities about what you know. I'm aware there's lots at stake here for you. Your career, your marriage, possible financial losses, and who knows what else. You may not realize it yet, but these things are in jeopardy, whether you come forward or not. You impress me as the type of person who has their priorities in order. What good are we as human beings if we're so afraid that we allow people to get away with murder? 
The world of secrecy is a dangerous place to live, especially when your mind holds information that could help convict a killer. I've placed my life in danger here in order to bring about justice and put an end to what may turn out to be more than just one killing. In addition, kids are continuing to commit suicides themselves, thinking Kurt did it, so it must be the way to go. The last of these incidents occurred just a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> Although I'm still in some danger, I feel my silence would have created an even greater threat to my life. Getting rid of someone after they talked is just plain stupid and can only bring more attention to the case. The real danger exists before the person talks. I think I've given you something to think about. Call me if I can help. If you choose to oppose me in all this, all I can say is good luck. You'll need it. Sincerely, Tom Grant. Carol never responded. A week later, on January 5th, 1995, Grant takes to the radio airwaves again, this time on the nationally syndicated Tom Lakis show, where he outlines his case in detail for more than an hour. It is during this appearance that Grant publicly airs the heart of his theory for the first time, charging Courtney Love and Michael Callie DeWitt were involved in a criminal conspiracy that resulted in the murder of Kurt Cobain. After Grant drops this bombshell... Lakis opens the phone lines to listeners. One of the first callers happens to be Gary DeWitt, Callie's father, who is understandably outraged. Gary DeWitt, I can't believe that this guy's going to make a huge score for absolutely no reason. Kurt Cobain killed himself, period. Lakis, ah, uh, so you believe our guest is out only to make a buck? Of course. He's out for the big score. There's a lot of money in it. Have you seen any of the evidence to prove that what the police said that this is suicide is true? Have you seen the evidence? No, but I've known Courtney about five years, and Mike is my son. And believe me, neither one of them is capable of something like that. When I heard this on the radio, I couldn't believe it. So I called Sergeant Cameron at the Seattle Police, and they're treating, my, and they're treating this guy like a nut. Let me ask you a question. Isn't it possible the cops don't like P.I.s messing in their business? Is that possible? No, that's movie stuff. After the show, Courtney leaves a message on Grant's answering machine at 4 a.m. Hi, Tom, this is Courtney. I just heard the radio thing. I haven't heard you tell it out, you know. I listened to the thing and didn't hear you tell, tell like, outright lies. <clears throat> I wish you were doing it for the money. And the realization that you're doing it because you think it's right hurts me a lot. Two weeks later, Grant receives another call from Courtney, who has just begun a tour of Australia and New Zealand. Her tone is more pained than angry. Courtney, if this is in your fucking head, I'll do anything to get out of... Sorry, guys. If this is in your fucking head, I'll do anything to get it out of your head. I don't think you're crazy, just a little paranoid. People would kill me if they knew I was calling you. Grant, I'm after the truth. Courtney, that's why I fucking called you. I'll do anything I can to get you not to think this. This is nutty and not true. I'd like for you to have every piece of evidence to prove that I had nothing to do with it. Grant asks her for a copy of the autopsy report, explaining that only the post-mortem records can prove that Kurt committed suicide. Courtney's response is unexpected. I spoke to the deputy medical examiner the other night. He said he'd come over to my house when I get back. He's angry at you. He won't give you the records. As long as Nicholas is the coroner, I'm not afraid. The Nicholas in question was Dr. Nicholas Hartshorn, the deputy medical examiner who conducted the autopsy in April and ruled Kurt's death a suicide. In late 1995, when we were researching our first book, a source close to Hartshorn told us that while he was still in college, he had befriended Courtney Love and her first husband, James Moreland. He met Moreland while he was still in medical school when, as a punk rock promoter, Hartshorn organized Nirvana's third-ever Seattle show at the Central Tavern in 1988. This means the bill that night featured not just one, 
but both of Courtney's future husbands, since the headliner just happened to be Moreland's band, The Leaving Trains. We decided to pursue this lead, and posing as Canadian university students who were doing a paper on the Kurt Cobain copycat suicide phenomenon, contacted Hartshorn for an interview. He agreed to meet with us at his office in December 1995. During our interview, Hartshorn confirmed that he had been friends with both James Moreland and Courtney Love, whom he describes as a great girl. When we asked him if his friendship with Courtney might have constituted a conflict of interest in the investigation of her husband's death, Hartshorn replied, absolutely not. He then confirmed that he had determined Kurt's death was a textbook case of suicide when he first arrived on the scene and admitted that the police never seriously contemplated the possibility of murder at all. He described Tom Grant's theory as ludicrous. The homicide unit came to the scene because of the popularity of the individual, he told us. I mean, Elvis is still walking around there, and when you have somebody this prominent, you like to get the best people in there to make sure all of your I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Look, it's all the people who think it's a conspiracy. If they hadn't done all this work, you would have many more people mucking about saying it's murder. Hartshorn paused for a moment, and we couldn't help noticing the huge Kurt Cobain poster looming over us from its spot on the wall. We were in the very room where Hartshorn had conducted Kurt's autopsy a year earlier. The suicide was Kurt's decision, he continues and you have to respect him for whatever his decision was. He had that right. <clears throat> now, in the New Zealand phone call, Courtney continues telling Grant about her recent conversation with Hartshorn. I asked Nicholas if there was any doubt in his mind whether this was a suicide, and he said, I've seen people fake suicides before. This isn't one of them. She then tells Grant that she is having dinner at Nicholas' house when she returns to Seattle on February 16th, and she will ask for the autopsy records then. A month before this conversation took place, Courtney had given an interview to Rolling Stone magazine, in which she claimed that Kurt had left her another hitherto unmentioned letter before he died. It's kind of long. I put it in a safe deposit box. I might show it to Francis, maybe. It's very fucked up writing. You know I love you. I love Francis. I'm so sorry. Please don't follow me. It's long because he repeats himself. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll be there to protect you. I don't know where I'm going. I just can't be here anymore. Grant was intrigued, not least because the note appeared to confirm that Kurt was not planning to kill himself at all, but rather was leaving Courtney. Her cooperation on the autopsy report promised... Grant takes the opportunity to ask her about the second note. Grant. What about the other note? You mentioned in Rolling Stone about another note that he wrote to you. Courtney. It's like a letter, and it's not really like a suicide note. It's like, it seems more like, it's like in a sealed envelope, and it's just like to me, it seems like he wrote it in rehab. Where'd you find it? It was in my bedroom, under my pillows. Under your pillows? Yeah, and I didn't tell anybody about it but Rosemary. And I told Sergeant Cameron about it. I let him see it. Well, there's only one problem with that, Courtney. What's that? I looked under your pillows. Uh, well, just like we looked under your mattress. It was there. That's how I found the rehypnol between your mattresses that... That note wasn't under the pillows on the bed. Tom, it was. And I showed it to Sergeant Cameron, and he can prove it. I own it. I'll show it to you, whatever you... If you want to see it. Yeah, I'd like to see it. I'd like to see it. But what I'm telling you is, it was not there the night before the body was found, or the night before that. Because we, you know... You can ask Dylan about this. We picked the pillows up. We were looking for drugs. We looked under the mattresses. That's where the Rohypnol was. There was no note in an envelope. In the same December 15th Rolling Stone interview, Courtney claimed that in his so-called Rome suicide note, Kurt had written, You don't love me anymore. I'd rather die.
than go through a divorce. Grant asks her about this note. Courtney. It's not very nice. It's mean to me. Grant. Did it say anything suicidal? Courtney. It says something definitely suicidal on the first page. It said, it's mean to me. It says, like, Dr. Baker says I have to choose between life and death. I'm choosing death. That's a quote on the note. Grant is clearly shaken by this revelation. Courtney has repeatedly told friends and journalists that Kurt left a suicide note in Rome. This is how most people have come to the conclusion that his suicide in Seattle was merely a successful second attempt after the first failed attempt in Rome. But this passage about Dr. Baker, a psychiatrist who had treated him at Canyon Ranch, clearly refers to Kurt's decision to continue using drugs rather than revealing an intention to kill himself. Dr. Baker had told Kurt that he had to stop using heroin or it would eventually kill him. In the note, Kurt appears to be saying he has chosen to continue his drug use rather than stating an intention to kill himself. Is this all there was to the so-called Rome suicide note? Grant asks her if this is the only thing Kurt wrote about suicide in his Rome note, remembering that Courtney already told him on April 3rd that in the note, Kurt says he's leaving me. Courtney, it talked about wanting to die rather than going through a divorce. Grant, do you still have the note? No, I burned it. You burned it? When he gave it back to me the day after Kristen died, Sergeant Cameron advised me, this will never do you any good or your family, so I burned it. Why would somebody tell you to get rid of that? Because it wasn't really nice. It talked about getting a divorce. At this point in the conversation, Courtney goes off on a tangent about the blood at the scene where Kurt's body was found. One thing that bothered me when I went up there, because I don't think Kurt died on the third for two reasons, because when I went in the room, I laid in that blood. There was only one clump of it. You know that photograph they ran on the cover of the Seattle Times? Well, the way Kurt's laying where the feet is, that's where the blood was. Grant. That doesn't make any sense either. How could there be blood at his feet and not at his head? Courtney. Somebody wrote things on the internet about arcing blood. The only thing that bugs me about... The only thing that bugs me is, why is his blood where his feet are? Grant. That's not the only thing that bugs me. Courtney. Why is his blood where his feet are? Why is that the only place where there's blood? Grant. I've never heard that from anybody. That's where it was, Tom. You saw it. You were with me, I think. It's all a fucking hallucination. Weren't you there? In retrospect, Grant believes she was trying to plant a red herring to lead him down the wrong path. I think Courtney wanted me to start talking publicly about the blood, about all kinds of garbage that can be easily disproved so that I would ruin my credibility the way this guy on public access is done. He is referring to Seattle man named Richard Lee, who has hosted a weekly cable public access TV show called Kurt Cobain Was Murdered since April 1994. Lee has been widely derided as a crackpot for his own bizarre theory, which suggests that Courtney murdered her husband, and the crime was then covered up by Geffen Records in the city of Seattle. <clears throat> One of Lee's central arguments is the lack of blood at the scene when Kurt's body was found. Grant ignores Courtney's questions about the blood and tells her that if she really wants to allay his concerns, she can take a polygraph exam and ask Michael Callie DeWitt to take one as well. Courtney. Callie's fucked me over. I know that in your job, paranoia is reality, but in my world, paranoia is also reality. I believe that when you tell me that Callie knows something, I truly believe that in my heart. Pause. You hear that? World is ending. I believe that... I believe you when you tell me that Callie knows something. I truly believe that in my heart. I know he does. You know he does. And I don't know what the hell it is, but I think he might have heard the gunshot is what I think. That's what my gut instinct tells me. 
I think he heard the gunshot. Grant. Would Mike be willing to come down and take a polygraph? For you? Courtney, here's the bottom line. The truth is really easy to get to. I'm just after the truth. If Callie can get down here and take a polygraph, we can clear this up before it goes any further. Let's get him down here and get a polygraph done, and then he's off the hook. You think Kurt was forced down or something? He only had about 60 or $80 worth of heroin in his body when he was found dead. Well, here's what can bring this to a real quick end and solve all your problems. If I have a copy of the coroner's report and if Callie comes down for a polygraph, this thing will be brought to a real quick end. It's as simple as that. I'll do a polygraph for you if you keep it secret. I don't know why. I love him so much. You love who? My husband. I love Callie too, by the way. That's why we can help Callie. If we can get Callie cleared through a polygraph, then he's out of it. And believe me, then I'm going to start looking like a fool and nobody's going to pay any attention to me anymore. He's with my daughter right now. I want him to be able to stay up there and not deal with this right now. I'm not going to turn around and call him at home and say, go to Tom Grant's office. I don't think Callie is lying because he's my friend. I hired him and I also pay him a lot of money. And he's one of my best friends, so... I don't think he would lie to me, but he might be lying to me. Grant believes her next statement indicates that she is getting ready to let Callie take the fall for her if things start to sour, if the police start to close in on the truth. Courtney. Mike was bad. I found heroin spoons in his room. He watched my child sometimes when he was on drugs, and Kurt was furious. He was firing Mike because he kept doing drugs. Kurt liked to have notes when he talked to someone. And I have a note he wrote. It's pretty lengthy. It's all the reasons why Callie can't be our nanny anymore because he's continuing to do drugs and yada yada. Grant pinpoints this conversation as especially significant. I think she was trying to get it into my mind that maybe Callie killed Kurt because Kurt was about to fire him, he explains. She was planting Callie's motive in my mind. In January 1995, an 11-year-old boy from Ile d'Orléans, Quebec, is found hanged in the basement of his family home. At the boy's feet, his father finds a note reading, I'm killing myself for Kurt. In the obituary, his mother pleads for other children not to listen to the negative music of Nirvana. Okay. Welcome back to me. A lot to unpack there. Let's briefly, you know, Courtney's planting red herrings as usual. Uh, We had Tom Grant's note to Rosemary Carroll. Okay. Just a good section to really read to you. And um, yeah, I actually didn't know until I reread this that Courtney was trying to pin it on Callie. Okay. Anyone but her. Now, All I really have to say right now, in the obituary, the mother pleads for other children not to listen to the negative music of Nirvana. Well, you're completely missing the point, but I can understand a parent's... You know, parents were scared of um, Nirvana and Cobain and that kind of angst in the same way that parents would go on to be scared of uh, Eminem and Marilyn Manson and all sorts of bands in the late 90s, and then we'd have Columbine, and so they were always blaming music for violence. Really, the violence tends to be in the periphery. It's not usually the band creating violence. But let's keep reading. Nearly nine years have passed since Grant first publicly accused Michael Kelly DeWitt of engaging in a conspiracy with Courtney Love to kill her husband. In 1995, we challenged Grant to show us any evidence at all pointing to Kelly's involvement. Why was he accusing Callie, rather than Dylan Carlson, of playing a part in the conspiracy, we demanded. After all, it was Dylan who bought the shotgun, and who apparently lied about the greenhouse. No, I ruled out Dylan as an accomplice early on, explains Grant. When I was going around Seattle with him looking for Kurt, he kept saying how he didn't understand why Kurt married Courtney. He was bad-mouthing her. And after Kurt died, he repeatedly said his friend wasn't suicidal. 
it wouldn't make any sense if he was involved. I reached a conclusion that Dylan was being used by Courtney, but that he wasn't part of the planning. Is Grant now ready to be more forthcoming about his reasons for citing Callie's involvement? The only thing I'm willing to say at this point is that there was a conspiracy between Courtney and Michael DeWitt, and there may be others involved, he responds. Remember, I never said I can... Remember, I never said I can solve this whole case all by myself or single-handedly prove that Courtney or Callie killed Kurt. <clears throat> There's still some questions that need to be asked. That's where the police need to go around with a badge asking the questions. It's too easy to blow off a P.I. People can't get away with lying to the police so easily. Neither Courtney nor Callie has ever responded to Grant's allegations, but Charles Cross's Courtney Authorized Biography offers some dubious details about Callie's activities the week Kurt disappeared, details that appear at first glance to deflect suspicion from both Callie and Courtney. In this account, Callie is said to have wakened on the morning of Saturday, April 2nd, to find Kurt sitting on his bed. He claims he told Kurt to call Courtney, and then drifted back to sleep, exhausted from a cocaine binge the night before. What follows is an account that stretches credulity, a description of Courtney's repeated calls to the house later that morning as she tries to locate Kurt. Back at the Cobain house, the main phone rang every ten minutes, but Callie was afraid to answer it, thinking it was Courtney. When he finally answered, he told her he hadn't seen Kurt. Still fried from drugs, Callie thought Kurt's bedside visit was simply a dream. Cross writes that two days later, Callie finally remembered that he had seen Kurt, and only then did he relay the news to Courtney. By the time Cross's book was published, Tom Grant had already publicly disclosed the fact that when she hired him, Courtney had inexplicably failed to tell him that Kurt had been spotted at the house on Saturday morning. This new account provides a convenient explanation as to why not. The problem is that is the problem is that it is demonstrably false. Grant interviewed Callie in May 1994, and in this conversation, the nanny confirms that he informed Courtney about seeing Kurt on the very same day he saw him, Saturday, April 2nd. Grant also interviewed Eric Erlins in the same month, and in this conversation, Courtney's guitarist revealed that Callie told him he had seen Kurt on April 2nd and informed Courtney about it that day. Moreover, Dylan Carlson told the Seattle Times on May 11th that he had received a call from Callie on April 2nd saying he had seen Kurt and that Kurt was acting weird. The account in Cross's book, therefore, has to be false. But where did it come from? Cross supplies no source. If it came from either Courtney or Callie, the implications are troubling. Equally perplexing is another account in Cross's book about Callie's activities on April 7th, the day before Kurt's body was discovered. According to this account, Callie had been staying at the apartment of his girlfriend Jennifer Adamson because he was afraid to be in the Cobain house. When Courtney found out about this on Thursday, Cross writes, she was incensed and she demanded Callie return to look for Kurt immediately. So that evening, Callie and Jennifer drove to the Lake Washington house with a friend, arriving at dusk. They searched through the house, finding no sign of Kurt. This is when Callie jotted the note in which she accused Kurt of being in the house without me noticing, and placed it on the stairs. <clears throat> Various media accounts, including Cross's book, have reported that the TV was on in the master bedroom, tuned to MTV with the sound off, suggesting that Kurt had been in the house watching TV. This is apparently what Callie is referring to in his note. However, when Grant and Dylan Carlson searched the house the night before and again on Thursday evening, they found the TV turned on in Callie's bedroom, not Kurt's. Cross writes that after Callie, Jennifer, and their friend Bonnie Dillard finished searching the house with night falling, the trio, with a great sigh of relief, got in the car and began to head down the driveway. As they were pulling away, Bonnie told Callie and Jennifer that she thought she had seen something above the garage. I just saw a shadow up there. But Jennifer reportedly believed her friend was simply being 
superstitious. And so they didn't turn the car around to check the greenhouse. It is an eerie story that makes for fascinating reading. Unfortunately, it could not have happened. According to the SPD reports, we obtained a gray top taxi was dispatched to the Lake Washington house on April 7th, arriving at approximately 4 p.m. The driver picked up a white male in his 20s, 5'8 to 5'9, medium to thin build, some facial hair and dark hair, and drove him to the airport. This description is clearly Callie's, as the SPD confirmed when they interviewed him a week later. Callie told police that he had indeed taken a taxi to the airport on the afternoon of Thursday, April 7th, to catch a plane to Los Angeles because Courtney accused him of hiding Kurt after he fled to the hospital, so he flew to L.A. on April 7th to tell her face-to-face that he wasn't. As a result, Callie, like Courtney, was in Los Angeles the day Kurt's body was discovered. So if Callie left the house... The house... (laughs) So if Callie left the house by taxi at 4 p.m. Thursday afternoon to go to the airport, it would have been impossible for him to have searched the house with Jennifer Adamson and her friend at dusk with night falling that evening, written the note and placed it on the stairs, and then left the house in in Adamson's car, as Cross describes in his account. According to the U.S. National Weather Service, The sun set that day at 7.47 p.m., almost four hours after Callie's departure for the airport. Moreover, Cross writes that Courtney only learned on Thursday, April 7th, that Callie wasn't staying at the house, and that she was incensed when she learned that he had been staying at the apartment of his girlfriend, Jennifer Adamson. This is why she allegedly sent him back to the house to search for Kurt on Thursday. Yet her Peninsula Hotel phone records prove that she had repeatedly called Callie at Jennifer Adamson's apartment many times that week, starting as early as Tuesday, April 5th, suggesting that Courtney was already well aware Callie was no longer staying at the Lake Washington house. Another obvious fiction, but what does it mean? Who is responsible for planting these falsehoods in Cross's biography? Clearly, somebody who wants the world to believe that Kurt was still alive, but preparing to die alone in the greenhouse after Callie left the house for the last time. Three years later, Courtney would award the construction company owned by Callie's father a very lucrative contract worth hundreds of thousands of dollars to renovate her Lake Washington house just before she put it up for sale. She had already secured a high-paying A&R job for Callie at Geffen Records. Still, we have never seen a shred of convincing evidence. Repeat that. Still, we have never seen a shred of convincing evidence proving that Michael DeWitt was involved in Kurt's death. When we confront him about this, Grant is evasive. The only thing I'll say at this point is that this was a murder staged to look like a suicide. If I play my hand too early and reveal everything that I have before the police get involved, I suspect that evidence will suddenly disappear. Stories will change, and those involved will tidy up their trail. End of chapter 7. Can you believe we made it to the end of chapter 7? Chapter 7 ended up being a four-part video. Lots of compelling stuff there, guys and girls. Lots of red herrings and twisty turns and, you know, Callie and Courtney trying to make it look like Kurt was just waiting for Callie to leave. And yeah, so um, I will admit, you know, a lot of those details get confusing. They're boring when you already feel you know the truth. And as I was reading, I did the last part of Heavier Than Heaven on this very channel, Southwest Studios. And I read the very passages that... um, Wallace and Halperin are quoting here, and I was duped to some degree, but I didn't quite believe it at the time. But let's be... Oh, shoot. What are you doing, Mijito? Yeah. Let's be honest here. Sometimes you learn things as you go along. I am an avatar for all of you in that, you know, I didn't necessarily believe Kurt Cobain was murdered when I was doing the Heavier Than Heaven. In fact, I didn't believe that. Okay. To me, it seemed like everything was just too much for him, and 
but there's just too much stuff here. Today, guys and gals, was a reading day. This was a reading chapter. It's April Fool's Day. Ain't no fool about it for you today. I don't like tricking people. Whatever. That's not really my bag. Um, Yeah. So we're going to continue to do this. And don't worry, this is a short video. I'm not going to talk at you for 20, uh, 20 more minutes just to pad out my usual 55. No need for that. Today was content heavy. And uh, I just don't have anything to say about it. But I will say, welcome to the new subscribers. Okay. And the reason I don't have uh, commentary on this specifically, the detail-heavy stuff where the authors are just reporting evidence and factual occurrences and their investigations, I don't want to get in the way. All I have to say about that particular stuff is, wow, compelling, interesting. Okay. So, a very warm welcome to the new subscribers. I've gotten some good comments, especially about the Kurt Cobain stuff. Uh, 25 years, guys. It is a pleasure to be doing this for you as we look at the man's death. Um, I hope you're listening to your favorite Nirvana tunes as we cruise along. I started this series uh, before winter even began, and we're out of winter. And if only Cobain could have made it out of the winter of his own mind, he might still be alive. But you, know, you see how ingrained it is? I don't think he killed himself. So it wouldn't really have mattered if Kurt um, got out of that winter. He was going to be killed anyway. But understand that even when you're doing a series of videos about this, I am ambivalent. Did he or didn't he? We are compiling the evidence. Okay, This was a very good chapter for evidence. It was a long chapter. And we're moving into chapter 8 probably tomorrow. As I said, Video every day this week in honor of Cobain and the 25th anniversary of his death, which was most likely a murder. Either way, the man created some of the greatest music ever made while he was alive. So, uh, But I especially want to thank the new subscribers and the people who comment and keep me going. I only do these videos because you say, hey, I like this. Cool. Just discovered your channel. Great. So thanks for listening. Give me the thumbs up. Uh, and I'll see you soon. This has been Media Gita saying have a nice day.